Okay, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Paul Stevens, editor of Short Term Rentals, and welcome to this first webinar of our new Rockstars series on the challenges and opportunities facing the short term rental industry. It's me, Paul Stevens, editor of Short Term Rentals. And before we kick things off, I'd like to bring in Colin Smith. Uh, from our Rockstars 3.0 series sponsor, Flywire. Very happy to have you on board. Colin is now going to go ahead and introduce his company. Colin, take okay. it away. First of all, thank you, Paul, for having us. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, honored to be here. I'll be brief so we can get into the discussion. Um, but Flywire is a global payments company. Uh, we're over 10 years old and we, we focus on high value uh, transactions, typically cross-border and domestic, um, and help cl travel clients all over the world uh, receive payments uh, from their guests um, in a variety of different fashions, whether it be credit cards, bank transfers, uh, alternative payment methods. Uh, the, the company actually recently just went public on the NASDAQ uh, in May, so super exciting time at Flywire um, and really, really excited to be a part of this discussion. Um, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out me, to me directly at colinsmyth at flywire.com or uh, flywire.com backslash assessment, and uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions. So thank you again, Paul, for the time. Really excited to, to listen in. Thank you, Colin. Delighted to have Flywire on as a uh, series sponsor to this webinar series. Thank you for your time. <laughs> um, so next up, in terms of webinar guidelines, please keep your sound on mute and your camera off if you're not speaking. I'm being ably assisted by my colleagues Justin and Floor today. All of the details are in the chat for you, so please do take any questions you have there as well throughout the session. Hopefully we'll have a bit of time at the end for that throughout and a recording will also be sent around to everyone who's registered for the session after this is taking place. So given it's a big day for football today, particularly if you're English or German nationality or Swedish or Ukrainian, uh, please let me introduce our Rockstars lineup for today and we're going to start with Fiona. Fiona, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for inviting me along today. I am the Chief Executive of the Association of Scotland Self Caterers. We represent, we have a membership of almost 1400 people um, and those members will either have like one or two properties or up to 50 properties. So we think we probably represent something in the region of 30,000 properties in Scotland. We're the oldest um, organization bar one, which is I believe, um, yeah, not us. Anyway, so yeah, that's who I am. And um, we've got an awful fight on our hands in Scotland to do with short term let regulations. Thank you, Fiona. And uh, next up, Matt from Smart City Policy Group. Hi, everybody. My name is Matt Curtis. I've uh, been working on the short term rental regulations issue for about 11 years now, working on this issue around the country and around the world, around the United States and around the world. I'm based in Austin, Texas, but this is a global issue. We've seen it pop up and be a very you know, big problem in Europe, uh, in Dubai, uh, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Japan, and other destinations around the world. So we've been working on consulting on this issue. I'm a former deputy to the last couple of mayors of Austin, Texas, and I work with a few other former mayors and former uh, policymakers from different uh, local government uh, uh, offices. And we work on consulting with convention and visitors bureaus, destination marketing organizations, vacation rental management companies, and short-term let and vacation rental associations on how to create good, fair, effective regulations that achieve compliance. That's gotta be the goal. How do we create regulations and rules that actually work? So often the rules that are created don't work. Uh, so uh, that's not good for the local uh, community and it's not good for the industry. So that's uh, uh, what we focus on. And we're excited about this conversation today. Thank you, Matt. And uh, thirdly, uh, Carlos, please. Hello, hola, my name is Carlos. Uh, I am based here in Spain, south of Spain, Malaga. Uh, we are uh, in Andalusia, we are about 70,000 vacation rentals. Uh, it's a huge market actually. In, in the very south, in actually Malaga, you know, probably already Malaga, Marbella, the area we got from those 70,000, we got like 40,000. And we got the Andalusia uh, Holiday Home Association, which I am the 
the president and then I'm a member of the board of the National Federation, which is Fevitur. And then Fiona and me, we are both member of the European Holiday Home Association. That's how pretty much uh, doing the same as Matt was saying, like we, we basically uh, look after the, the interests of the uh, industries defended uh, from Europe into local communities in different type of leg legislations from uh, city planning to taxes to any kind of legislation. Thank you. And Carlos, and last but no means least, Pam, please. Hello, everybody. My name is Pam Knutson. I'm the Senior Director of Compliance Services at Avalara My Lodge Tax. We handle the compliance portion of short-term rentals from end to end, from everything from the licensing and registration on through the filing of the returns and the remittance of the tax liability that's associated with those. You know, similar to what Matt said, the regulations are around this industry are just continuing to increase and grow. And that's part of where we come into play is to make sure that we understand what those regulations are and can help the property owners and the property managers and the platforms make sure that they're meeting those regulations. So we work directly with everything from the individual property owner on up through the online travel agencies to help make sure that the regulations are being met and that uh, jurisdictions are happy with what's happening. Thank you, Pam. Back to you, Paul. <laughs> so for context, we're going to be analyzing the regular regulatory landscape in Scotland with Fiona, looking at Airbnb's community fund in Edinburgh and the delayed third public consultation on licensing laws. We'll be exploring the importance of advocacy during times like these, uh, with Matt and Carlos, for example, we'll be delving into Pam's piece on thriving amidst uh, change and disruption, and also Brian Chesky, Airbnb, his vision for this so-called travel redistribution term we've been hearing a lot and covering a lot recently on short-term rentals. So that just gives you a bit of a flavour of what we're going to be discussing today. But firstly, I, I would like to um, delve a bit more into the regular regulatory outlook in the ver various markets that our speakers are covering today. So I'm going to turn to you, Fiona, first, because um, when we're having our conversation before, you raised a lot of very interesting points about um, what's being proposed in Scotland right now is more draconian than in China. So I'd like you to give a uh, sort of explore give us a taste of what is happening, the current situation in Scotland. Um, of course, you've got this talk of re registration schemes and the tourist destinations like Edinburgh, um, and, and sort of where your role with the ASSC comes in. Thanks, Paul. Well, as Matt said, you know, I think we're facing these challenges all over the world and um, in different parts of the world, they're kind of approaching it differently. Now, I know that in many parts of Europe, they're kind of watching what happens in Scotland. And we understand why they're trying to regulate because there's this kind of perception that we are an unregulated sector. Now, what I've always said is that I'm fully regulated. You know, I've been operating a self-catering house in Scotland for 19 years. I comply with every single health and safety legislation there is going. I pay the right taxes. I do the right things. I feel entirely regulated. But what they're talking about are really these amateur hosts that have been able to start operating via online platforms um, such as Airbnb. There are other platforms available, but that the, the word Airbnb has become this kind of uh, this this creature that uh, jurisdictions have become terrified of almost. So you're also getting people saying that uh, short term lets or um, whatever you want to call them, are impacting on the housing crisis, on neighbourhood amenity, all of those things. Now, all of this has kind of convoluted itself up into we are a problem sector. So lots of different places are wanting to regulate said sector. Now, the Scottish government, in its infinite wisdom, has decided to go down the route of the Civic Government Act, which is about licensing. So when we're talking about regulations, you're either looking at licensing or um, registration. Now, 
a lot of people don't actually understand the difference, but licensing is to do with authorization, whereas registration is me telling the local authority that I am doing it and I comply with the mandatory conditions. Licensing, the local authority can come in and just close you down or revoke your license or refuse your license. Now, there's a cacophony of reasons why that's not going to work for our sector. And bearing in mind that licensing in Scotland covers things like prostitution, urinating in the streets, dogs biting people, it feels slightly offensive that we're being put in that bracket, I have to say. But what we've been saying to the Scottish government, and I've been dealing with this for since 2016, um, is that a, a simple online registration with mandatory health and safety conditions is the answer. So as a sector, we're not afraid of regulations, but my point is that we already have those regulations. We just need to make sure that everybody is complying with that level of regulation. So we need Bob in his tenement flat in Edinburgh, who lets out his property on Airbnb. We need to tell him that there are fire regulations already in place, that he needs to pay tax on his income. All of these things he just needs to be told. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's a communication and education piece. What we don't need is a, as you say, entirely draconian system of licensing where they're going to get it wrong. And, you know, we've got to stop associating us with property crises and increased rent and all of those other things. They're conflating a number of issues. And whilst the Scottish government is saying that actually this is all about basic health and safety, it's not. It's about antisocial behavior. It's about the housing crisis. It's about all of these different things. But trying to explain that to these people is just nigh on impossible. So I think throughout the world, we're dealing with exactly the same issues, but just different countries are dealing with it in a different way. I think this is probably going to be quite a common thread for our discussion. I know from speaking to our other panellists here that they're thinking perhaps along the same lines as you, but you talk, we've talked there about China already um, and briefly mentioned other parts of the world. Are there any parts of the world that you would look to perhaps that Scotland and indeed the rest of the UK, the rest of the world can maybe look at for best practice? So. Our friends in Portugal. Our friends in Portugal have got it right. And Carlos and I work very closely with um, our equivalent over in Portugal. They've got it right. They've got the message through that A, it needs to be dealt with by the tourism team, um, tourism directorate rather than the housing directorate. Um, they've got a proportionate, sensible approach, which has encouraged compliance rather than generated people trying not to comply. It, it, I, I think Carlos would agree they, that that is best practice and the best example we've got to go with. Well, indeed, let, let's turn to Carlos, though. It seems a good point to segue into you. But... It's a very good point with what Fiona made, and, and there's a main reason for that. And we, unfortunately, we don't have that in Spain. And this, the main reason is that whatever the legislation is, and, and as Fiona said, is completely right, we've got a way more legislation than any other type of accommodation. We've got a specific regulation for vacation rentals that not hotels, camping, or any other type of accommodation has. And um, the good thing about Portugal is that when they decide a, a, a legislation, it just applies throughout the whole territory. In, this, in this Spain, we've got already 17 different definitions of a vacation, legal definitions of what a vacation rental is. You've got to look at one in Andalusia, the one in Barcelona and in Madrid, which Again, if you are an operating company or you are an investor and you want to have, uh, you, you want to put your flag in different locations, uh, it's focused in Spain, like you want to put a, a, your accommodation in or invest in Barcelona, Madrid, Valencia, and Malaga, for instance, uh, you've got to look at thousands of different legislations. Actually, in Spain, they just approved that the platforms, it's a new call, it's a tax model, and they, they need to all different platforms like Airbnb, Booking.com, they need to send to the tax office, which is with the specific details, with the check-in date, check-out date, the reference of the location of the property, and how much money it was per reservation. All that data, which is which is great, it's an exercise of transparency. It's going to help us understand what is the the contributions in terms of taxes to the of our industry to, to, the, to, the, to the country. 
but it's only specifically applying to vacation rental. So uh, as Fiona said, there's so much re regulation that uh, most of the people don't really know already. And, and Carlos, smart conversation as well. It sounded like vacation rentals or however you would wish to define it, they're treated sort of fairly diversely across different cities, like you say, Madrid, uh, Valencia, San Sebastian, even where you are down in Malaga. How do you think vacation rentals, this type of lodging has been treated perhaps in comparison with other, maybe you could say more traditional types of lodging? Well, there's two things happening. All the details, all the, all the information, the data we have about vacation rental is a winning, let's say, is on the winning side of the table because the industry and the demand is going towards our type of accommodation. We saw, uh, Glenn, the, 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 we saw the CEO of Booking.com saying that they saw an increase of 40% in demand of vacation rental. We've got data also from Expedia saying that 60%, uh, almost 60% of the reservations have been contained in vacation rental. We've got data that 68% of the Spanish uh, families are going to be booking a vacation rental in the next uh, 18 months. So the demand is going towards us. Uh, the market is, is completely in our favor. And I can see somehow that the traditional type of combination is a bit concerned about that. Uh, but what the discussion that we see here is that from hoteliers or traditional accommodation, as you say, Paul, we have these problems. You guys should have the same. It's like, no. So if we saw that there are legislations and there are policies that are not making sense uh, and they are not uh, incentivizing investment and professionalism of the industry, why not take this opportunity uh, and, and make a change? So that's a kind of a discussion that it's on the table in terms of lobby uh, and, and vacation rental association. That's a kind of the fight and the negotiation on the table. And then the worst thing about this, Paul, as you can imagine, is that you have to put a, you have to put a politician in the middle. And that's always uh, bad news. <laughs> well, let's turn to someone who knows all about politicians, um, Matt. Um, more from a US outlook, but um, I know you wanted to touch on like, the history and wh wh where mm -hmm. do you think these conversations about regulations began? Well, you know, there's that conflation between bans and, and restrictions. So, you know, what, what's your what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, it's 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 my my thoughts is from what I lived. It was uh, uh, it was right in the mix of it all, and unfortunately, we were at the time in a in a much less funded position to be able to provide the level of help that I wish we we had. And then I think the industry, many of our vacation rental management friends. Uh, the folks in vacation destinations, I feel overwhelmingly thought that this was going to be an issue that only applied to the big urban areas, to the big cities. It would never come to Malaga, Andalusia, um, you know, to Devon uh, in England and so many other destinations. So I feel that what happened is we had a very traditional industry that was upended when Airbnb created this new uh, phenomenon by capturing this great way of allowing people to find holiday lets so much more easily through their website. But at the same time, they also promoted a new concept that, like it or not, was new. Um, you know, we could argue that, you know, some people had done the home sharing of their individual property in the past, but never to this extent, not even close, not even a millionth, uh, million times this close. So um, Airbnb really promoted this new home sharing model. Well, they also went out and with a well-funded campaign, promoted the home sharing policy. And the first city that they approached was Amsterdam. Uh, and it was about 2011. Um, now they were also talking to San Francisco and Portland at the same time. They were uh, San Francisco in California, Portland in Oregon they were selling this concept of let's only allow the home sharing or you know, someone's primary home uh, model and we'll call it collaborative consumption or the sharing economy. 
And this will allow uh, for uh, more people to operate uh, within this space because as they would speak to these uh, uh, policymakers in different cities, they would let them know that their real problem was people taking whole homes, entire units off the market and creating a, a, a housing crisis. Now, I love Airbnb. I think it's a great company made up of great people. I know that they were doing stuff to try to help grow their business. And they may have thought that they were doing good things in policy making. But what was very clear to me was by not being transparent, uh, by not representing the entire breadth of the industry and allowing for all the different models, they uh, limited uh, models in those big cities very early on. And then other cities started to copy the Amsterdam model or the San Francisco or Portland model. Once that was let out of the box, once that was open and available for policymakers to see as an example, they all wanted to copy it as a best practice. And that is the history of how this issue really started. Um, it's unfortunate. Uh, I don't think it's representative of the industry. I'm sure that Airbnb would do things differently if they could go back and change things today. Now, uh, in, in 2021, we still see cities trying to copy that model uh, if they allow whole home vacation rental properties, uh, we see that more frequently in vacation destinations. And they'll have significant heavy restrictions on the activity. When they test the outcome of these policies, what they see is the person who's operating in a non-professional manner, the, the uh, home sharing model person, is less likely to be compliant because they're only doing this infrequently. They're only doing this part-time. They're not professionally thoughtful about their approach. So they aren't always paying taxes. They're more likely to have noise, parking, nuisance issues. While the, all the audits and studies on professional operators, oddly enough, have the highest levels of compliance. Uh, Pam is uh, uh, here with us and I'm sure probably knows that professional property managers have the highest rates of paying taxes, following all the local rules, because that's what professional managers are paid to do. But unfortunately, cities limited professional managers while allowing more non-professional operators, and that's being copied in vacation destinations. Uh, so as we go through this discussion today, whether it's our friend Eduardo with Alep in, um, in Portugal, or all the different country associations that we've formed over the years, or, or the Pan-European Association, uh, it's important that we're involved and we're talking about compliance because that's gotta be the goal. And knowing the history of how this became uh, confusing to policymakers, I think is important as well. I think we can definitely agree that there's been um, some confusion there. So thank you very much for those, those findings, Matt. Um, we we'll turn to Pam next, it's a nice, um, segue between the two. Uh, Pam, how are you seeing um, taxing authorities actually now cracking down on, on compliance? This is a bit different to um, our other speakers. So what, what are you noticing over, over your, your way in the States? Yeah, so there's a number of things that are happening. You know, one of the, the big pieces that has happened across the States is this concept of marketplaces that says that, hey, if you are renting, you know, if you are a platform where people are, are putting their properties up for renting, et cetera, and you hit certain thresholds, you're classified as a marketplace, which means you're now responsible for the collection and remittance of those taxes to the various local jurisdictions. So they've really taken a look and said, we want those big players to take ownership of this and to hold them accountable. And along with that, a lot of the jurisdictions are really implementing some pretty significant fines. So, you know, if I look at one of the, the major platforms, for example, said they looked at the 7,000 properties that they have for Hawaii, and of those 7,000, 5,000 of them were not actually in compliance from a licensing and regulation standpoint, as far as having the necessary permits and licenses, et cetera. So now, those platforms are becoming responsible to say, look, if you're going to list these properties on your platform, you have to make sure they're in compliance. And various jurisdictions are putting some pretty hefty fines in place around doing this. Like Denver, for example, it's a $1,000 fine, Denver, Colorado. 
it's a thousand dollar fine for every single one that is not compliant or regulated. Um, you know, you look at San Bernardino County in California, they've actually made it a criminal misdemeanor to not be in compliant with this. So, you know, there's some really healthy fines and some repercussions along with this. So it's forcing two things. It's forcing the, the individual property owners to say, oh, I have to do something or I may have some pretty serious repercussions. And it's forcing the platforms, including the property managers, because property managers have been included in this concept of a marketplace to say, we have to ensure that the people that are listing on our platforms or in our sites are compliant because we don't want to have not only do we not want to have the reputation, we don't want to have the liability that's associated with that. So, and as individual cities and states and counties do this, other ones, similar to what's happened to what Matt talked about in terms of looking at Portland and looking at San Francisco, other cities and towns look at what's happening in these other ones and say, hmm, we could do that too. And they start to do that because they want to make sure that that regulation is in place. And so it just continues to up the bar and the requirements around that and the difficulty that comes along with making sure that people are compliant with all the different things that come into play. Mm, thank you, Pam. And I see, uh, Fiona, you said that the Scottish government is proposing £50,000 fine for non-compliance. So, I mean... Or prison. Okay. Over it, we'll right. be in there with the prostitutes and stuff and the, and the gun <laughs> and all them lot as well. I mean, on, on that basis, do you think maybe the short term rental is seen as um, is maybe misunderstood or is being seen as something that is easy to kick down, scapegoat, etc.? And maybe why this is the case, if so? Well, I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think we have a massive definition problem. And Matt's just sort of touched on that. You know, when does a professional self caterer become a short term let or a short term rental? What, what's the difference between a professional and an amateur? And it's quite interesting. I was actually having a conversation with um, the tourism director at the Scottish government this morning. I said, can you tell me how many short-term lets you think there are in Scotland? Because the other day you mentioned 32,000, um, but I can tell you that X number on the non-domestic rates roll, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, well, it really depends how you're defining short-term letting. And I'm like, well, that is precisely the problem. How can you deliver policy if you don't know who you're regulating you know are they regulating should it actually be the um airbnb act 2021 or is it unfortunately all these professionals as matt's been talking about have been corralled up into the same box as these people that are doing it on an amateur and and unprofessional basis and unfortunately we can't seem to escape from that. But interestingly, when the Scottish government first delivered their um, licensing order back in December, I watched them walk into this. I waited until the order was actually put before parliament. They'd, they'd added bed and breakfasts into it because what does a bed and breakfast do? They offer home sharing in the traditional sense of the word. So they didn't realize they'd included bed and breakfast into the licensing order. I think huge that, mistake, huge I think mistake. I reporting on that this morning with um, the story about the, uh, the third public consultation and that they, these B &B, traditional b, b owners weren't actually aware that they had been included when it was stated previously that they were exempt. That's but, well, but the point is that the people that wrote the document, that wrote the order, didn't realize they'd done it it was a mistake and now they're having to backtrack out of it which is amusing to watch quite frankly but it doesn't help bnbs the length of breadth of scotland that are all going to have to get a license as well i guess this just increases the need for advocacy for our for our sector and that i mean you know what listening to what pam and carlos and fiona have all said you know what sort of what are the policy solutions when there is this fine balance between just outright bans and compliance like we're talking about? Yeah, you know, so at the beginning of my earlier uh, comments, I, I mentioned that uh, a little bit of the history, but it was just a quick snapshot. I think another history point that I should make is many of our uh, vacation rental, short-term rental management friends 
really thought this issue would not become as big of an issue as it has become. And for a long time, thought that it would not happen in their town. And what we have been trying to say now for 11 years is that it's, it's coming, and it is. And for anybody who still thinks it's not going to happen to them, it will. So that's important to remember. The next important thing to remember is that rules can be okay. There are certainly rules that are good for the community and good for all your neighbors. And it's you who know how to create those rules the best. You're the, a leader in your industry. That's why you're a, a, a manager of properties or a thoughtful uh, uh, owner or you know, a, a vendor of, of, of vacation rentals or you know, holiday homes. So I suggest think about the rules that you would like to have applied to yourself and think about creating rules that make sense for the industry and bring those forward to your local government and bring those forward with other representatives of the industry from your community. If there's already an association, join it. Join the local alliance or your national alliance. If there isn't one, then create one. And it could just be you. It could be you and a couple of other people. Uh, but bringing rules around nuisance, around ensuring payment of any obligated taxes, uh, ensuring rules just to, to make sure that you know people have a good experience when they come to the town and have a good the neighbors have a good experience with those visitors. I think that all of our own our, our friendly holiday home uh, managers and vacation rental managers can think about what would make sense. Think about those and bring those to your local government. Because otherwise what we're hearing from Fiona and from Carlos from everybody is when policymakers try to decide what's good for your industry while they're considering the hundreds of other issues on their discussion agenda that week, they're not going to make sound decisions that make sense. It just isn't going to work. They don't have enough time to really understand this, um, this issue. Now, there's different thoughtful platforms where you can learn more. One of them is obviously here, being part of this discussion today, being part of any conference. I'm a former board member of the VRMA highly recommend uh, being part of the VRMA. The VRMA got, helped get started almost every uh, country association in Europe and the EHHA. Um, and, uh, you know, I think being part of the VRMA is helpful. We're having, my own company is having a short-term rental, vacation rental regulations summit on September 1st during the U.S. Conference of Mayors in Austin, Texas. Uh, we do that every year. This will be our third one. So feel free to join us there. Or, you know, look out for any of the upcoming meetings of the EHHA or any of the country associations. Then take those learnings and bring them to your town hall and talk about how can we create these good regulations that would benefit the whole community. The economic impact of this activity is too big to ignore. These local governments need that economic impact and it's good, it's healthy economic impact. But at the same time, they're going to create rules. So help them create those rules. Just think about what makes common sense for you and then put that down on paper and bring that into uh, your local town hall, uh, your local government. Essentially, it sounds like it's th th this importance it, that is very important to be present and visible in communities. And I'll turn to Carlos next. We're talking about events and uh, and all this with the EHHA as well. So, you know, from the work that you're doing with Ava in, in Andalusia, uh, Carlos and uh, Evitur, um, you know, do, do you think that the vacation rental industry is becoming more widely respected? And, you know, with the sort of uh, things that, that you're doing, um, you know, is it, how, how can it be better represented? I, I know that you're um, for example, doing a, some of your own in Spain as well. So, yeah, how, how would you go about approaching that? Um, very interesting, very interesting topics that you guys are mentioning, Fiona, Pan, and Matt. It's, it's quite a lot of information because, as you, as you said, like in, in an association, you get information from pretty much all the stakeholders in the industry. And, and as uh, Matt was saying, if, you, if we as an industry, we don't have a voice, we are not a structure and we're not organized, then the legislators uh, and the policymakers, they're just going to listen to the hoteliers. 
So they're going to be the one deciding on your business. They're going to be the one that are going to, uh, obviously they don't want any competition. So they're going to try to ban your business. So the fact uh, that and the recommendation that's been set about associate, become a member of an association, be part of it. Uh, in Europe, we got HHA, EHHA, in Spain, FAV2, in Andalusia, ABBA. But if there's none, just create one because the, the, actually, the, the actual politician, the policy maker is dying for an advice, is dying for data. They need your advice, they need your recommendation, they need to solve a problem. So if you become part of the solution, they want to work on that piece of paper that you uh, create to, to help them understand the industry and instead of a piece of paper that is going to come for the hoteliers. So it's extremely uh, relevant to have a voice, to have a representation. How, how, how are we making this uh, happen This uh, in, here in Europe and, and Spain? As you said, we, we do have B2 Summit. This is an event we, we're going to have an in-person event, finally. And in person, we're going to be able to see each other and do proper networking, finally, for once. And it's on the 28th and the 29th uh, October here in Malaga. So it's actually great weather. It's, it's a good place to be. And these kind of events, they, they should, and, and they've happened in the past. This is a sixth edition. And, and it's a great opportunity because we put together, Fiona has been there many other years, we put together the EHHA members, we put together the tech companies, the property developers, the investment, the tech companies. We get all together and we finally, uh, throughout all the networking, then the panels, the conversation that we have with the, everything, get, everyone get together with the politicians, with the policy makers, we actually show the numbers, the contribution that we have to the economy. They see the, the, the impact, the positive impact they see. So they get a wider perspective of what's happening uh, uh, and the impact again that we have. Just to give you an example, in Andalusia, six euros out of the 10 euros they each each 10 euros that they the holiday maker you know in a vacation rental spends is spent in actual like a little shop a grocery a car rental so we've got a very valuable clients a very valuable uh, guest and we need to present those numbers uh, on these kind of events to the actual policy makers to the to the audience out there so they they understand us uh, as then as it's been said Everybody think a bit about the peer-to-peer -peer economy, uh, the Airbnb, the booking.com. It's a way more transactional uh, and, and complex industry. We are affecting the tourism, the, the residential tourism. Like we've got a lot of people that they come here to Andalusia, they buy a property, they spend six months of the year. The rest of the year is a vacation rental. You get a lot of that in vacation rental destination. We got we are super relevant, obviously, in the real estate market with uh, as a, for the golf uh, tourism, for the shopping, for the health tourism. So we are such a relevant uh, industry in the tourism across the tourism industry that somehow this, the, the politician and policy makers they still don't realize. So we are the ones that need to to make that happen. Again, events being. If you cannot be a member of, the, of your local association, go to the, one of these events, come to the two summits, but be proactive. Just, just try to, to, to spread the voice about how much guests you had in, in the last year, how, how much impact you had in your community, and then talk to, to these guys, to the, to the politicians, because they, they really need that. I was just going to jump on something Carlos had mentioned, you know, the opposition, the, the, the voices that so often diminish our industry and really, unfortunately, have the negative impact of driving up non-compliant behavior. Be because you've got these, uh, you know, folks that are saying, oh, this is terrible and you must either create bans or restrictions that don't make sense. What they wind up doing is driving the activity underground. Without fail, the activity still goes on. It just goes on underground and creates a terrible experience for the local communities. So um, uh, in, in, in a strange sense, the, the folks that are speaking out against this activity and is speaking in favor of bans or bad restrictions, they're actually creating a worse outcome for their community. One of the ways they do it is they just use anecdotal after anecdotal 
pieces of information. They, they tell stories, they expand about things that they heard. All of that is anecdotal, it's not data. So one of the important messages that Carlos uh, pointed out that one that you get when you form an association, that when you come together, even if it's just you being thoughtful about yourself, is you start to create real data. That's the only way you're gonna ever defeat the anecdotal argument is by having data to be able to disprove um, the, the, those angry voices and to be able to prove, hey, here's a better outcome that will help you achieve what you want for your community. Sorry to judge Paul on this, because that's a very interesting point. When we had politician, media, hoteliers saying that vacation rents are create an impact and an increase on the real estate market, we got research that the impact of the vacation rental on the real estate price affects, uh, the, the impact is like below 2%. It's, I think it's 1.67% impact of the location rent in the real estate market. So that kind of data is super powerful, but again, you need to be legitimate to say that and send the message. Uh, I just want to bring a uh, pan in uh, on this next point, because I think we also need to hear that, that um, operators, you know, how can these operators and owners, how can they actually ensure they're remaining compliant in, in these times when the government requirements and standards are, are shifting, certainly, I think. What are you seeing over there? So I think there's a couple of things. I think, you know, Matt and Carlos and everybody has mentioned a few things in terms of the associations that are really kind of monitoring this, having a voice in it. I think really being involved in that type of a thing to make sure that you're being heard and that you are coming forth with data is a critical component. But it's time consuming and it's complicated and there's a lot of different things going on. So there are companies like Avalara who's our job and our role is to really just say, hey, here are the regulations and the things that you need to be compliant about if you're going to operate in this particular jurisdiction, et cetera. You know, the economic impact is, is not just from a tourism tax it, it, or from a lodging tax. It's the economic impact to the local restaurants and to the local stores that people sometimes fail to remember and think about, you know, people think about it when they think about more traditional lodging, but they don't necessarily realize that that same impact is happening when you have these short-term rentals and this home sharing. And so making sure that you can, you know, provide that data while being compliant and saying, look, we want to be compliant. We want to help out the economy. We want to do all of this is really a critical factor to help being a voice and kind of shaping that but again, knowing that you are compliant and, you know, so making sure that you've got something in place, whether it's an outsourced company like ours or the associations or whatever, to make sure that you know what the compliance regulations are and you can have a voice not only about the existing ones, but upcoming ones is a critical factor. And, and do you think this kind of results from the short term rental industry kind of going under the radar until now? Certainly you know from the work that we're doing at short-term rentals and from what we're hearing is now the kind of lodging of choice for a lot of travelers yes i you know so to be honest point there's a lot of as she called it unprofessional people you know ones that are doing it that are kind of below the radar these are you know individual property owners that they're like oh hey i'm going to be gone for a couple months because i'm going to go down to arizona in the winter time i'm going to rent my place out they don't think about this from the standpoint of saying, hey, there's rules and regulations associated with this. And so that ends up causing a broader swath of problems. It is one of the things that the platforms like Airbnb, Verbo, and the other platforms have brought to life is because now, you know, because most people are using something like that to rent their property. And that's one of the reasons that the jurisdictions have really targeted those places and those companies to say, we need you to make sure that these people are in compliance because you are seeing those ones that are flying below the radar. You know, again, the numbers that I talked about in Hawaii is the perfect example, 7,000 and 5,000 of them weren't registered. I mean, that's definitely flying underneath the radar. And that's, you know, that is one of those things that needs to change and people need to be take this from a very professional standpoint. If you're doing this, you need to act as a responsible owner in terms of doing this so that not only are you protected, but you're also protecting the industry as a whole so you can continue to do this. So making sure you're compliant is a critical component in this. 
Thank you, Pam. Um, I know there's been a bit of a, a conflict during this time, I'd say, between this perceived over tourism that some some people some people have coined this term now, um, and also the balance between that and um, attracting domestic travellers. I know, Fiona, you've got some pretty strong opinions on on the term over tourism and really what that um, the connotations of that, but. You know, how, how do you think we can encourage people to, to travel domestically and beyond maybe more traditional um, tourist destinations and, and do it all compliantly as well? Well, I think you're absolutely right. I think the term over tourism is lazy. And it goes back to what Matt was saying about anecdote and narrative versus data. What is over tourism? When, do you, when does one too many people arriving in your destination become over tourism? Now, what you do need to do, and absolutely, is make sure that you A, manage the visitors to your country. So for example, in Scotland, Visit Scotland, who is our marketing organization, has done a fantastic job of getting people to Sky and to Edinburgh. And you constantly see pictures that you think, I really want to go there. And who was on this call just earlier that said they wanted to go to the North Coast 500? They've done a brilliant job of marketing those destinations. But what we need to do is now manage our visitors, send people to Dumfries and Galloway, send people to the Isle of Mull, get people to come away from the Isle of Skye and realise that there are more places to visit than just these iconic hotspots. Now, again, we need the data. What, what is over tourism? You know, is it having a negative impact on those areas? You know, then we start looking at the tourism tax situation. And a lot of people in Scotland say, yeah, but if I go to Spain, I'm going to pay a tourist tax. But they don't actually realize that 70% of our market is domestic. So we're taxing ourselves to go on holiday in our own country. And they also don't realize that um, in Spain, the VAT level is so much further reduced than in Scotland. So we have 20% VAT in Scotland. We are 140 out of 140 in terms of cost competitiveness in Scotland. What we don't want to do is add additional taxation to our visitors. So there's kind of, again, all of these issues are conflated. And I it just goes back to the almost impossible task of educating our politicians to understand the importance of our sector. As Pam's just said, it's not just the restaurants and hotels that our guests go and, and, and give valuable impact to. It's also our service providers, our cleaners, our painters and joiners, you know, all of that, that ecosystem, that huge ecosystem. And you know, let's not forget country sports in Scotland. So they come up to Scotland, they stay in a self-catering property and they go shoot deer. That's a huge industry that they're not going to go and stay in a hotel and shoot deer. They're going to go and stay in a self-catering property, for example. So, but that understanding of how far reaching our sector is, is, is so important that we try and get that message out. But as you say, in terms of over-tourism, it's as lazy talking about over-tourism as it is saying that short-term letting is impacting on the housing crisis. It's just boring and anecdotal. You know, I, uh, that's, so, those are incredible points. And, you know, one thing, it, it sparked a memory of mine as well, that so many people in this audience and so many of the folks that I'm sure you're always trying to get engaged with, Fiona, uh, the, the, the other managers, the other operators, uh, and Carlos and, and the folks from different corners of, of, of Europe, is that so often the other managers and operators will think that the large OTAs at Airbnb and the other uh, folks will do all of this work for you. And you have to remember that they are going to take care of themselves first. And one of the things that we talked about at the front end of this conversation was uh, that Pam had mentioned were the regulations targeting the online marketplaces or the OTAs. So they're protecting themselves from those kinds of regulations first and foremost. They're not going to do individual battle for the vacation rental manager or operator until they make sure that they are safe from the rules that could apply to them. 
So that's why you need to be engaged because you need to look out for your own interests, just like you would in any other walk of life. No one else is going to do this for you. You've got to be engaged. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, it, it's surprisingly easy. And I haven't seen a single manager or operator get engaged with an association to uh, either, you know, uh, work on advocacy issues or anything else like that and not see their business grow. Many people think, oh, uh, you know, this is going to take away time from my business. I've seen every manager actually flourish successfully because they're more engaged as a thought leader in the industry and they do very well because of it. Yeah, it's great you've come in there, Matt, because I know in, uh, in the call before we were talking about this travel redistribution that Brian Jessica at Airbnb has been talking about how travelers are going to or spread their wings and travel beyond more of those traditional vacation destinations that we all know and love. So do you see that now as a real growth opportunity and perhaps who, who do you think is going to benefit from that? Well, I do think that your uh, the, the markets that Fiona was mentioning, the, uh, the non, you know, A plus markets, but, but the next markets down are going to see a decent growth. I think that what Brian Chesky knows and what we all know is that people are becoming addicted to great experiences. So it's not just about going to these beautiful destinations because there's beautiful destinations everywhere and they can have these great experiences everywhere, maybe at a, at a, at a more affordable rate uh, or maybe just with less, uh, uh, you know, uh, concern about, you know, competing for tickets. Uh, but uh, whatever it is, they, they know they can have great experiences in different destinations. And they are starting to see that if there are vacation rentals or short-term lets available in different communities, they can take advantage of those and really enjoy these other towns. Uh, and Carlos, in, in uh, Andalusia, what, what do you see maybe as the main growth opportunities for our sector? Is it in these... Um, we were talking about what the occupancy rates and I need some good statistics there that would provide some encouragement. Yeah, basically the data we have is that uh, especially in rural areas, uh, that's where the rural area and by the coast are the, the, the areas where we're getting more uh, demand throughout the pandemic. The, during the summer of the actual pandemic, we got a, we had a 70% occupancy rates. We actually had property managers that they manage uh, their, their portfolio exclusively in like villas in rural areas. And they were in the middle of the pandemic recruiting staff because they were completely full. And now this, this year, we are already seeing in the last uh, month that we had, especially like through the weekends, that they've been fully booked. So there is a huge opportunity. What we see, there's a, a big change in the way that people see vacation rental is a way more normalized. Again, we are here talking about the legislation, the policy makers, but that's the administration. Then what the market understand is that this is a very convenient uh, product to enjoy. Is uh, in, in Andalusia, we got 65% of our uh, clients is families. Uh, and then about almost 30% is couple. So this is a very convenient a product for the markets um, and it's it is uh, driving pretty good numbers as I said um, some of the points that we mentioned and you mentioned of the tourism again um, and Fiona mentioned before the uh, like how how you cope with success and I, and I in, in our previous conversations Paul we said this article about uh, McKinsey which is actually called coping with success they actually state many different resources for policymakers, for different administrations about how to manage that success because it's a way more efficient to manage the success than to actually achieve that traffic that creates so much wealth in your destination. There are many tools you can work with happy hours for museums that you know that they have some bottlenecks and it created saturated streets with uh, queues, etc. You can put uh, uh, leisure activities in different locations of the city, not only on the prime location and the main street. So there are many resources that we can uh, work around. And I think that is the responsibility of the administration to work on that. It is the responsibility of administration to drive a good uh, connectivity 
digital and physical in those rural areas that eventually uh, there's not that much uh, employment or there's that, not that many opportunities. This is a good opportunity. So this pandemic, I think, uh, put on the table all the different opportunities and accelerated a lot of the innovation and trends uh, that we're going to see uh, in the future. But then uh, definitely there's that work between private uh, organization and public organizations to be coordinated and try to, to achieve this, to get this together. But then, as you said, uh, Paul, the numbers are, uh, and the fact and the data that we have is pretty solid. It's, about, it's, it's now about being efficient and being um, flexible and fast uh, in the way we react to these opportunities. And um, then, you know, I know you're, you're speaking to the uh, Scottish government in a couple of minutes, so you can you can sort of sum this up quite briefly if you want. But how do you how do you maybe see how can this industry go from strength to strength as we emerge from the pandemic? Do you believe? I think, as Carlos has just said, um, we are going to be the holiday of choice for a long time to come. People are now not just holidaying in our properties. They're also working in our properties and using our properties for all sorts of different things that they never really realized um, that they could do. And I think, you know, the, the, the domestic tourism is, a, is this such a huge market. If we play our cards right, our sector is going to go from strength to strength. I have absolutely no doubt about it. We just need to A, make sure that regulations don't knock that on the head and B, um, give people those quality experiences that they now demand but I think I think we've got a hugely positive horizon to look forward to yeah thank you and I'll give the um, final word to Pam because you know we see a lot of uh, areas Pam that are still recovering from the pandemic so you know we expect probably authorities to be um, you know in enforcing restrictions um, more strictly. So how, um, how do you think this will impact on compliance moving forward? I think, I mean, again, I think all of the jurisdictions are looking at this, all of the taxing authorities are looking at this in terms of, you know, not only their own budgets, but the economic impact in the general vicinity. And, and I think they're going to continue to figure out how do we enforce compliance? I think they're going to continue to figure out how do we what are the things that we put in place? Who can we hold accountable? How can we find these people that are kind of under the radar and make sure that they are in compliance? So, you know, I think it, it is one of those things that for the health of the industry, everybody needs to look at this and say, look, compliance is not, it's not trying to stop you from doing business. It's trying to make sure that you can do business for the long term. And so how do you get engaged and make sure that you're doing this because to Fiona's point, I mean, the, the industry is changing. The, the ability to, you know, vacation in your own backyard, that domestic travel, that domestic tourism that people discovered during the pandemic where it's like, hey, I can go someplace that's a three hour drive away that I would not have considered going before because it was always, oh, get on a plane and fly someplace. But people are now discovering those more local, those local destinations and Again, the short-term rental gives them so many options about how do they change, how they interact with people, how do they avoid crowds if they still have a, a concern about any of those things. And that's what that industry brings. And so by making sure you're compliant and being involved and you know, dealing with all of that, you ensure the health of the industry. Not, it's not a negative for you, it's the health of the industry that allows you to continue to, to be part of it going forward. Thank you, Pam. Paul, if you allow me, like compliance with Pam saying is actually super relevant, like compliance, but what we see in, in a lot of destinations is that they're setting rules that are just impossible to compliance. So what we need to, we need to, to find that connection between the market demands that they are completely, so with the pandemic, they're completely new business models that are gonna just gonna be coming, like senior co-living, spaces for uh, remote working, uh, service apartment is definitely going to increase the, the concept of, of uh, brand residence, all that uh, aligned with the new projects that are coming in the real estate market with built to rent projects with all this business model on top. If 
the, the legislation is is not aligned with what the market is evolving and the demand it's always going to be difficult to comply uh, and that's uh, i think that's one of the biggest challenges thank you Carlos. well thank you again to all of our contributors to fiona to matt to Carlos, to pam we had lots more questions um lined up but i think we just had to and let the conversation run its course and we've had some really interesting discussions today so thank you well we're going to be back in two weeks time on tuesday the 13th of july with the next rockstars session and that's on the importance of pr and hospitality so i do hope you can join us the sign up details are in the chat now and please contact me at paul at international hospitality media that again is in the chat if you'd like to contribute to any of our upcoming rockstars webinars also really looking forward to our inaugural in-person urban living festival in London at Tobacco Dock on the 26th to the 27th of October 2021. You can find out more information on our exhibitors, sponsors and partners at urbanlivingfestival.com. Really grateful to everyone's support. And for sponsorship opportunities, please do get in touch with my colleague Katie. The details are on screen now. Big thank you again to our uh, series sponsor, Flywire, and to Colin uh, for joining us today. Really grateful for your support. Uh, so feel free to contact us via our various channels. Uh, all that's left for me to say is thank you again for listening, everyone, and to our speakers, of course, and we'll see you all again very soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Yes.